membership minute. Start off by letting you know that we are recording this uh, session, and I'm going to be sending a link out to the, uh, the to the government community affairs email list with uh, a replay of this session as well as the presentation itself. So, um, yeah, just a couple items. Our, our uh, membership minute from Tiffany Hall. Um, as you all know, the chamber is the voice of business of the Douglas of Douglas County. Uh, we're a membership based organization. At the end of uh, January, we have 785 members, and our goal is to drive that up to 1,000 over the next year. So it's a pretty ambitious goal, but is really where we should be at a minimum, I think, in a, uh, a county the size of ours. Our connections to local and state elected officials offer members access to meaningful conversations around growth, new economic development opportunities, and quality of life issues that impact our community. Substantial investment in our local community is happening all around us. So join the chamber, let us connect you to people like you're gonna hear from today, the change makers and visionaries. Uh, ask your business associates if they're chamber members, there's never been a better time to invest in our shared economic success. So if you're interested, please contact Tiffany Hall, our membership director, or feel free to drop something in the uh, chat here and we will, uh, We'll follow up with you. Uh, next, if you have not done so yet, uh, you have one day left to register for our membership breakfast with uh, KU football coach Lance Leipold. That is happening uh, Tuesday the 15th. Uh, Travis, oh, good timing there, Travis. If you see in the chat box, Travis just dropped a link there. So again, if you haven't registered for that breakfast, uh, that's next Tuesday. And you need to register today or they're being cut off here, I think, tomorrow, Travis. Um, let's see. So, yes, other than everybody who's come in should be muted. Please stay muted so we can see the uh, presentation itself. And then uh, if you have questions, pop them in the chat. Um, and I might just call on you to ask the question or I might ask it myself at the end, uh, just kind of depending on, on the timing of things. So. Uh, with that, I think I will turn it over to this year's Government and Community Affairs Chair for the Chamber and Board Member, Paul Davis. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, constantly impressed uh, with uh, the Chamber staff. Uh, you mentioned uh, how it's uh, the, your deadline to register for uh, the breakfast with Coach Leipold, and uh, there's Travis with the link to do it. So uh, you guys are, are, are on it, as always. Um, we are going to uh, do something just a little bit different um, with uh, today's uh, lunch speaker. Um, oftentimes, you know, we're, we've got people who are in the community who are uh, talking about things that are that are going on in the community or at different levels of government. And uh, uh, I think today's speaker is is going to be uh, a kind of a welcome change uh, from that and uh, talk about something that's. Uh, uh, related, uh, but yet uh, just a little bit different. Um, so Mike Garish is the Vice President for Marketing and Customer Experience for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas. Uh, Mike uh, has moved to Lawrence uh, somewhat recently, although he lived here before, uh, back when he worked uh, for Payless, but he's uh, spent the last 11 years in uh, a similar position with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa. And uh, I've had an opportunity to, uh, to get to know Mike, and um, I think uh, you're, you're really going to be impressed with, uh, with what he's got to say today of uh, just how uh, things are changing in the workplace and uh, uh, how uh, we all uh, uh, have to adjust in certain ways. Uh, so, uh, Mike, I will turn it over uh, to you and uh, look forward to what you have to say. Unfortunately, I've got to get off uh, here in a little while for another obligation, but uh, I, I am going to come back and watch the recording of this because uh, I'm, I'm really anxious to hear what you have to say. So uh, thanks, Mike. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. I'll make sure I don't say anything bad about you after you leave. So since it's recorded, um, Paul's also my attorney, so I have to disclaim that. So thank you, Paul, for introducing me to uh, the who's who um, in Lawrence and Douglas County um, in particular. And thank you, Hugh, Hugh for the invitation. Um, it is very weird that a Midwesterner that um, the universe has called me back to Douglas County twice in my career. Hopefully this is the last calling. Um, I plan on moving nowhere. I just moved into a new home in Lawrence. 
uh, this past weekend, and I'm really excited to be here and and just thank you for having me here to kind of jump in the community and get involved. So I, I thought the best way to start is what we're seeing at a national and uh, local level from a marketing and experience point of view. And at the end, I would love to get your perspectives as business owners on uh, what I present today is uh, trending or what you're seeing differently um, and to use this more as a working session. As Hugh had mentioned, I will have all the slides available for you all. Uh, this is all secondary research, so I want you to have it, use it, share it. Uh, it's, it's my gift to you. So um, good research and analysis doesn't mean anything if you don't share it. So uh, you'll have that after. So with that, I'm going to start the presentation. I am going to be in full screen mode, so if you do have questions in the chat, I'm going to rely on Hugh to uh, interrupt me to answer some questions. Um, there are about 45 slides here, and it's not death by PowerPoint. I've tried to make it as interactive as possible with some good stats, but I'll try and reserve questions to the end if you could. If there is a burning question, feel free to interrupt, and I'll do my best to answer it in presentation. Um, but with that, I will share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, um, assuming you can all see this, can I get a... Um, looks good. Looks good, okay. So let's jump into this. So why talk about the modern workforce? Um, well, first and foremost, um, it's the great resignation. You've all heard of it. One in four workers quit their job last year. 4.3 million people quit in August alone. It was the new high since back in December of 2000. And the fact of the matter is this great resignation is going to continue. 55% of Americans anticipate looking for a new job this year. In the last 18 months have been a time of basic uh, reevaluation. And really what's driving that is time. So people have had time to think um, and they've had time to really reassess um, what they wanna do and how much time they wanna do um, this, this work. And if I had to put it into a headline, I would say people are saying, take this job and shut it. The pandemic has revealed how much people really hate their jobs. And that's really unfortunate. Um, if you look at the other stats here, it's really been the great uh, illuminator of many sorts. So people realized, um, you know, unemployment um, is up. 66% of unemployment um, consider changing their jobs uh, altogether and trying something completely new. And the pandemic, no pun intended, unmasked a deep uh, unhappiness that started uh, a lot of Americans um, have had with the workplace. Stress, to toxic work environments, uh, the commute, travel, all of it just kind of culminated in this uh, great uh, illuminator or great resignation. But it's not just about people being dissatisfied either. It's not people that are just unhappy at work. It's also given people um, some deeper perspective um, and how they're living at work and how they're um, changing how they want to work. And we talk about this uh, work-life balance. It's more like life-work balance. And when people are thinking about um, the benefits of the pandemic, have been more time with family, bonding with our spouses and partners, uh, recharging, exercising, sleeping, um, sharing a more authentic version of ourselves at work. Um, kind of those vulnerabilities had to come out when people had to have those awkward moments at work, um, the, those adaptive life hacks uh, in order to function. But working from home wasn't a win for everybody. Um, it actually hit some people really hard. Um, sorry, I keep on getting getting an advancement here. Um, really, there was two paths that employers took. One, they really leaned in and embraced employee, employee well-being. And other employers um, really put em employees in high-risk work conditions and they had to come, come into work. There wasn't remote options. So there's been this real stark uh, contrast between the different types of workers. Uh, people with advanced degrees were largely working from home. While the people, 90% um, of those with high school diplomas or less had to show up in person. And probably the worst um, stat was what the pandemic has done um, to women. So facing um, 
4.2 million women dropped out of the labor force and only 2 million returned. And that's an $800 billion um, income impact in 2020. And it set women's progress in the workplace back by more than three decades. And that really does shine this light on how inhospitable and precarious the workplace could be for caretakers. So based on that kind of high level overview of kind of what's happened, and, and none of that is stuff that you probably haven't read or heard of, but just putting it in one place to kind of give the perspective, I thought was really important. But then what I thought I would do from here is take you to kind of a national, so what does this look like in terms of numbers nationally, but also locally in Kansas? So nationally, the employment demographics, 156 million uh, employed out of 333 million. 23% uh, are uh, the largest uh, cohort is ages between 25 and 34. 84% uh, of workforce uh, full-time, 16% part-time. And you can see some of that educational breakdown is 44% of current employed workforce is a bachelor's degree or higher. And you can see the breakdown there of um, uh, less than high school, high school, or some um, advanced degree. The employment trends in 2020, employment uh, lowest since 1999, as I mentioned before. Um, unemployment rate um, continues to drop from pandemic highs of 14.8% as of December, uh, unemployment rate at 3.9%. And then the labor, labor force participation rate, 59.5%. Uh, um, we'll get to Kansas here in a moment. That's much higher than that. Um, and then the quit rate, uh, November's quit rate was the highest in recorded history. Um, 4.5 million employees quitting their jobs, as I mentioned earlier. Quit levels grew the most in leisure and hospitality. Uh, that's a national trend. And unfortunately, it's also a trend here in Kansas. I'll get to that just in a moment. So those national employment trends, uh, education, health service professionals, um, wholesale and retail trade industries comprise almost half of all employment. But the winners and the uh, losers in, in terms of transportation, utilities, construction, professional and business services grew nationally. And unfortunately, leisure and hospitality industry was hit the hardest. So what's going on in Kansas? So Kansas employment demographics, um, there were 1.4 million employed uh, in 2020 out of 2.9 million. So 48% of the total population, uh, a little uh, uh, more than the national average of 44%. 24% of those are consistent with uh, the national averages, which is in that 25 to 34 uh, bracket. What I thought was really interesting too is that over 60% of the employees are under the age of 50. And I think that that's really interesting too, to talk about the future generation of workers and how does that impact us um, here in Kansas. So um, I thought that was interesting too. Some of the employment trends, um, obviously just like the national trending really um, closely, unemployment rate uh, has dropped since November. Um, the labor force participation uh, has dropped a little, but it's still almost 10% higher than the national average. Um, that I shared just moments ago. So th that's a directionally good thing. But when you think about the bigger macro picture, um, sorry, one more here. Um, the Kansas population grew 3% in the last 10 years, 84,000 people. But this growth um, was led by counties and metro areas when we have most of our rural counties we're showing declines and 80 counties of the 105 in our state are showing those declines. So you can just see that heat map Fortunately, as you can see in Douglas County, we're actually growing. That's great. Um, but when you think about the modern workforce and we think about employees, if we have a state that is decreasing in population and eligible employees, our eligible employees are not only in the county next to us, but they're also expanding in across the entire nation. So that's the big takeaway here. So where do we go from here? And what I thought I would do, I've got two more sections of this presentation. The first is, who is this modern employee and what do they want? And then I talk about, I mean, as an insurance executive, I'd be remiss not to talk about the benefits and, and what people really want out of an employer. So I'm going to end on that. Uh, but I thought it was important to kind of take you through more of a macro trends of what's happening with workers in general, not just health insurance focused. Um, and the reason why we study this is obviously as the largest health insurer in the state, 
Um, we cover most employers in terms of their health insurance. So getting to know our audiences and what they want and they need as employees uh, or what their employees want is crucial to our business success. So that's why we do this research. Uh, by the way, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that our partners at Barclay, they're our, our um, research and advertising agency out of Kansas City, um, did a lot of this work in commissioning this research. So I want to give credit to them as well. So post-pandemic, um, workers know their value. So the, res the great resignation isn't just about what people want to leave behind, but it's more importantly about what they want to go towards. I shared an earlier stat that 60-some percent of people were actually thinking about trying something completely different. So um, first and foremost, um, employees want an employer aligned with their values. Um, so 61% choose a job based on their personal beliefs. 57% want a job that better fits their values. Um, and they also want their employers now more than ever to take a stand against social issues, which can be very controversial to a lot of different employers. Um, but 60% say the country won't be able to overcome our challenges without business involvement. So people are expecting and literally demanding um, their employers to take a bigger stand on some things. So I guess the key takeaway for you all is as an employer, um, you need to know what your employees value and align those um, and make sure you have shared values because it does make a difference in who they want to work for and if they want to continue to work for you. So the second big trend here is um, sharing the power. Employees want to have a voice. So 70% of employees um, expect employers to stop certain business practices. Um, and, but only 41% say that, the, that they would actually do that. So this again is creating this tension out there where um, essentially employees are gonna start voting with their feet even more than ever. So what does that look like? Um, seeking organizations that they can trust. Here's some stats here in, in terms of what um, employees expect. So employees have an opportunity to meet this need, uh, behave in trustworthy manner. Um, employees are more scrupulous in judging their employers and prospective employers' actions. So this, unfortunately, you can see some of our journalists, friends, and media uh, is on the decline. Uh, but there are other areas that are uh, increasing. People are expecting more of their employers. So I think this is a great opportunity for us as business owners and operators uh, to kind of lean into this transparency and, and talk about what's going on to build trust in our employees. And kind of related to that is this whole thing of ESG, which you know I, I think is the next evolution of corporate response and social responsibility. But Environmental, social, and governance um, is, is what that stands for. For those of you that aren't familiar with that, it's an, more of an emerging um, strategy that a lot of uh, national companies are, are leaning into. A lot of our groups are actually asking us, what is our environmental, social, and governance strategy? Um, so basically, it's how we show up in terms of um, what are we doing for the environment, uh, our carbon footprint, uh, what are we doing to attack um, social issues, what are we doing to create better policies? So that's really important to the modern workforce and the modern employee. Um, as you can see, these numbers are climbing, um, but people are expecting us um, to have opinions and to have programs in place uh, to support environmental, social and governance issues. So mental health um, is, is vastly uh, evolving and the pandemic just really brought this um, to a head. Um, just from a data point for you all um, at Blue Cross and Blue Shield, um, our top 10 telehealth services, uh, the top eight out of 10 were behavioral health based. So that shows you that there's a huge demand uh, for behavioral health services and, and people want and need those. Um, this last year, to meet that consumer need, we launched a, um, a provider finder for mental health. Um, you can see the link there. Um, and we've had over a thousand people um, schedule uh, telephone or virtual appointments through that, which to give you context is, is up about 500% from post um, pre pandemic rather. So employees want um, employers to destigmatize mental health. There's all kinds of things that employers are doing, um, expanding these benefits, um, providing uh, benefits for people to stay emotionally healthy. Uh, and then also doing these whole company mental health days, closing the company for a day or an afternoon to do things. It's becoming much more of a priority. Um, and it's not just a nice to have, it's becoming a, a need to have a requirement. 
The, this next section is, um, there's three slides here, but it's really important because flexibility in work location takes on a lot of meaning. And I know many of you on this call do not have the luxury of having your workforces work remotely, and I'm sensitive to that. So I wanted to give you some stats um, on kind of what's happening uh, on flexibility. So flexibility in work location is here to stay. That's the bottom line. But there's many different uh, flavors of what that looks like. So um, the ability to connect and get work done from anywhere all the time is obviously what most people think about uh, flexibility. Um, but also just changing things up into working from home or working a few times a week or hybrid models. So a couple stats here, 59% said flexibility is more important than salary. Um, that surprises me. And I don't have time at lunch today to go into the generational differences, but it is in the appendix and I found it fascinating. It goes through everything from the silent generation to generation alpha. And it really talks about generationally how salary isn't the driver as a Gen Xer, salary title, those things were really important to me more so, but give quick example, my nephew who lives in town here, he's a, a dash for cash type person. Um, he works 20 hours a day to make money for rent and food and then takes two days off. That is not as uncommon as it used to be. Um, in my generation, uh, that was never acceptable, but today that is becoming more and more modern. So that flexibility is really important. 77% prefer to work for a company that lets them work from anywhere. Um, other than fancy corporations. Um, coming from Iowa, um, an employer who built a, um, a huge new building uh, in, in downtown Des Moines, uh, which economically helped the downtown significantly in revitalizing the western part of Des Moines. But I will tell you that building, as beautiful as it is and as modern, LEED certified, um, the, you know, now with remote and hybrid worker functionalities, a lot of companies like that are really questioning, why do we make that big of an investment? So those are all very real things that we're, we're all dealing with. Um, this is another piece of flexibility is that states um, are not only competing to attract individuals um, from other companies, but also from other cities and states. So this is really interesting. Uh, Choose Topeka offers up to $15,000 for a few people to uh, live there. Um, 5,000 have applied, 40 have been accepted. Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Tulsa Remote is looking for 250 remote workers, um, and they'll be offering a $10,000 um, incentive for that, sorry about that, um, to help find housing. Um, another data point um, in Iowa, um, as many of these small communities are literally um, dying, these towns are dying, people are just are moving away and they're, they're not coming back. They're offering a, a quarter acre of land for free if you move there and establish a primary residence within 12 months. I mean, that is the competition that's out there for your workers today, is neighboring states are getting very creative um, in terms of pulling your employees away from, as you saw earlier, uh, an employee base that's actually shrinking more than it's growing in, in our uh, areas. Now in our county, it's growing, that's great, but we have to think about the rest of the state as well. So big question, what about the non-remote eligible jobs? Uh, so this other wave or the next thing after working remote and hybrid and that, that wave, it's really this when I work uh, and how much I'm expected to work. And the data actually backs up that people are more productive when they have more of that flexibility. There's a stat here from the Harvard Business Review about um, organizations seeing 55% um, of their workforce as high performance versus 36% of organizations with a standard 40 hour work week. Um, the takeaway here is expect to see jobs where employees are measured by output versus agreed upon hours. A quick local example, um, as I mentioned, I just moved into a house uh, working with a local architect um, because of the flexibility of their employer here locally. Um, we met at 8 p.m. until 10 p.m. several nights um, to complete the work. So that's just a, a local example about how this is showing up in our neck of the woods. And then lastly, the real need for um, behind flexibility is this autonomy. People really want this sense of ownership and empowerment. So um, mandates feel like a violation of autonomy, which is one of the most important intrinsic drives of threat and reward in the brain. It's researcher David Rock. So employees want a say in how to spend their day. The key takeaway is how do you look for ways to help them decide from creating um, 
a work day that starts and ends when they want, unlimited PTO, uh, personal time off. A lot of companies move from that, uh, choosing days to work from home, um, giving back some of that power. I mean, it really is more that employee choice um, workforce that uh, companies have to adapt to or people will move. People are moving. Let me, let me rephrase that. So how are employers responding? So um, the re remote has employers geographically expanding, potentially um, employee posts and incentives. So I've even seen here walking down Mass Street, sign on bonuses at restaurants for people um, to work there, um, higher starting salaries, um, more on the, on the job training. And then also a lot of professions are showing uh, up to and including at Blue Cross and Blue Shield is um, downskilled job requirements. Um, I recently hired somebody um, on my staff as one of my direct reports, and we used to have a uh, college degree requirement. I eliminated that requirement because um, this particular worker um, had 20 years of customer experience leadership, and that's a resource I wanted. So that's just one local example um, uh, of how employers uh, have to adapt to this. Another example is uh, employers were going to be renting talent to fill these gaps. Uh, contingent contractor workers, which interesting, before the pandemic, people were shifting away from that. And now they're actually going back to it. Um, and again, this is not an informational for my, my company, but um, we recently did this with um, a KDHE employee. Um, we hired an individual to help us. Um, I kind of call it like the, the SWAT team approach or the Navy SEAL team where you just airdrop somebody in to, to help you with a problem. And they helped us develop a uh, pop-up vaccination stations at the service areas around um, Kansas a couple months ago. Uh, and it was very successful. We wouldn't have been able to do that if we were to hire somebody full-time and bring them up to speed. They wouldn't have had those connections and, the, and be able to deploy something that quickly. So that's just an example of uh, how employers have to get creative. If they want to meet their business goals and try things, they're going to have to do things differently. Um, and then lastly, more than just a paycheck. So the expanded role of the employer is the social safety net. This is probably, I would say, the most important slide if I had to pick one. So making sure I make a good wage is one thing, but um, my physical health, which that's predominantly what we do here, but also this expansion into mental health, um, but also this financial health piece. So, you know, health is wealth, wealth is health, and, you know, even people at our own company, uh, if an emergency happened, they couldn't come up with $500 in cash to, to pay for it. And, and that is at our own company that is a financial service company and in health insurance. So um, we're piloting a uh, financial coaching um, this year and um, we're really leaning into that because all these things are connected. And so anyway, 2022 is gonna be the year where the employer um, really looks for things that were maybe not popular out of bounds and providing it as a, um, as a benefit um, to their employees. So uh, one last thing in this section was just in addition to the remote jobs, um, uh, there's this also physical proximity thing that's emerging, which is um, workers um, being close to um, on-site nature, uh, workout, medical care. Um, so if they call these work arenas um, which again, it's not all work from home. If we can create environments like in Douglas County where we can partner together with our organizations uh, to create um, neat synergies for people to be flexible. So for example, I'm in this office here, um, the former um, uh, Lawrence World Journal as well as the post office and nobody's here. And once things open up, uh, this is a really cool creative space that we could and should be using for meetings and other things um, that, that's part of uh, um, the history here and that I think people will be interested. So how can we kind of bundle together to make things more attractive for people to interact? This is one example. So employees shifting from managing employees' work experience to helping manage their life experience. I said this before, but work life is dead. It's really life work. Um, increasing visibility in the personal lives of employees. We've all seen it and got to know each other more personally than we probably ever thought we would. <laughs> Um, but how do you help people kind of navigate through that? Uh, and employers that support employees with their life experience saw a 21% increase in the number of high performers. So it does have a correlation with performance. So at the end of the day, the whole adage of if, if, I, if, if I don't create the rules, people are going to slack off. That's just not showing uh, to be true. 
Um, and I wouldn't be a marketing person if I didn't talk about employment brand. So when we think about the, the concept of everything talks, so how you recruit, how you train, how you hire, how you fire, um, all those things talk. So um, this whole thing of um, where, where people work and the companies they work for, um, that's going to continue. People are going to demand transparency. They're going to judge you as a prospective employer and how you treat your employees. Um, employee experience is going to be the next big thing. Um, and I work in customer experience. And the bottom line is if I don't have a great employee experience, I can have the best product, the best brick and mortar. Um, but if I have a, a, a crappy employee or they're not engaged, um, that whole value proposition completely falls apart. So um, again, nothing you all probably don't know and have already heard, but it, you you have the uh, the research that's saying that now more than ever, that's going to become even more important, um, particularly, and, and I, I probably should come back another time here to talk about generational differences, but the new generation of worker, um, what they value is completely different than uh, silent generation boomers or even generation X, just the value proposition of what what's important to them um, is is very different. Um, than what a lot of us are used to. So um, last section, about four slides here, uh, basically the impact of the modern workforce on benefits. So just wanted to touch on this quickly. Um, despite the efforts of some employers, um, COVID really sh illuminated the shortcomings of a lot of benefit packages. And I'm not just talking benefits in terms of health insurance, but I'm talking about time off and um, you know, overall the, the overall employee benefit package. So employees are willing to change their jobs too for those benefits. 52% uh, Prudential Insurance study um, said that they leave their jobs uh, for one with the right benefits to meet their lifestyle. And it's important not to wait uh, to fill the benefit gaps as the majority of employers have taken action. 80% of organizations expanded benefit options related to remote work in 2020. So 43% um, expanded telemedicine, 39% childcare leave, 27% adult caregiving leave. This is a new thing, a bigger thing that's come up um, with people like me that are, are helping take care of their parents. And how does that fit into your work life? And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, mental health services. So those are the top four that are really driving a lot of the adjustments. So going forward, um, employers are looking to expand this even further. So 98% uh, of leaders surveyed plan um, to newly offer or expand at least one employee benefit. 90% of employers will still view healthcare as the most valued benefit to workers. However, after healthcare, um, benefits employers view as valuable, um, and this is in ranked order, flexible work, flexible leave, family friendly. I had to do some more research on that. That basically means um, can you bring your kid to work? Some people are allowing people to bring their pets to work. Um, so it's, it's, are you accepting of that whole person? Um, wellness, uh, retirement and professional benefits. So in exchange for the expanding benefits, um, most plan to deprioritize at least one type of benefits. So, um, onsite childcare, um, paid vacation, commuter benefits, tuition reimbursement, and food and meals, this is another um, example, uh, a local agency that you know has free beer, uh, free keg, you know, that type of stuff. People don't care about that stuff anymore. Um, it, it's a nice to have, it looks good on a, a brochure or recruiting, but uh, it's really not value add. People would much rather have uh, a covered mental health benefit or um, some of the other things I mentioned. So to sum it all up, the four categories of benefits for the modern workforce and what they want now, uh, mental health and well-being, child or elder care, uh, financial well-being, um, and COVID-centric benefits. So uh, the mental health of employees and their families is really important. Um, as I had mentioned, eight out of 10 uh, tele telehealth claims from us, our own company, uh, is the largest health insurer. We're for behavioral health-based. Um, employers understand how essential mental health is, um, not only for the individual, but also their family and extending those benefits to kids uh, in particular. Um, I don't know how many articles I've read on the negative impact and as a, a father of three school aged children, um, that is real, that uh, depression, anxiety, isolation, 
Um, and, and when you think about the future worker and, um, it, you know, coming from a generation where if you had a therapist, it was taboo, the new generations is the question's different. The question is who is your therapist? Um, so we have to really adapt and, and be open to talk about that. But a lot of employers don't even know how to talk about that or how to even bring it up. And, and how do we um, demystify some of that? It's going to be really important. Uh, child care benefits uh, are rare because they're really expensive, um, but they are in demand. Um, I would, will give you a quick personal story here. Uh, we had another employee who was getting recruited out of state um, to a firm in San Francisco to be a designer. And they offered her 100% remote uh, and a sign-on bonus. And our policy at work was we don't have 100% remote. Um, we worked with our department. We changed some policies, and she's now 100% remote. We retained that worker here in Douglas County, um, and uh, she's one of our star employees. And she has two little ones, and she couldn't find daycare in Lawrence. So it was either I have to take this new job that allows me that flexibility with 100% remote, or um, you guys need to help me out. So that's hitting closer to home than than um, some of these national trends. So. Um, Again, 85% uh, of working surveys uh, of working parents survey don't have childcare benefits. Um, so that's pretty staggering and that's gonna become more in demand. Um, without care, people can't work. I kind of talked about that. Um, uh, employers feel more responsible for workers' financial well-being. Um, employers uh, are implementing financial wellness programs uh, that cover a range of topics like planning for healthcare retirement, budgeting, managing debt. Sorry, that's a... That's a typo there, my apologies. 62% um, of the number of employees who felt extremely responsible for workers' financial well-being jumped to 62% in the last, the latest B of A uh, workplace benefits report. So um, people need help with their financial well-being. Um, and it, this is not a low income problem. This, uh, th th this um, financial well-being spans uh, across every single demographic, every single um, in, um, pay band from low salary earners to high salary earners. Um, so again, bigger paycheck, bigger hole in, in a lot of people's. Uh, and, th and this again, we have data even from our own company of people that are struggling uh, that make really good wages that uh, are taking loans against their 401k and other things um, that aren't financially prudent uh, when we can really help them, but they just need the tools um, in order to do that. And then last, um, 2020 brought the need for COVID specific benefits, uh, increased paid sick leave for workers, not only for themselves, but their families, uh, waiving COVID testing and treatment co-pays, uh, access to healthcare professionals, a lot of this telephonic stuff I've talked about. Uh, companies also got created with digital perks, um, monthly snack box deliveries, virtual gym memberships, uh, paid meditation, virtual cooking classes, magazine subscriptions. I mean, people are really trying to get creative to make sure that employee experience uh, is better than not only their neighbor, but people that are literally recruiting them from other states. So that concludes my presentation. I know that was a ton um, to go over in 40 minutes. Um, like I said, I will um, share all of these slides so you can dig into it. There's also links in there. So uh, if you don't like what I said, you can actually read the full article to get uh, your own uh, review or your own takeaways. I also wanted to just quickly show you the appendix um, so you can see the generational analysis and then some employment projections for the next 10 years. So really good stuff, but I just don't have time to go through it. But it talks to you about those different demographics um, by generation, what is their age, uh, what is their population, uh, what is their employment, where are they um, working, uh, what do they value. Again, please use this as you think about your employment strategy. That's what it's there for. It just kind of breaks it down by, um, um, by the different cohorts and tells them what they value and, and what they're into and, and why you should care. Um, this is the stuff we use as marketers uh, all day long to understand how do we talk to people. I'm sure you do this same type of work in your own neck of the woods, um, but I just thought it was really interesting. Um, a little scary as well, as I think about uh, Generation Alpha, which are the majority of my children and uh, what they're uh, looking uh, forward to. But the fact that they've grown up in uh, all of these major 
global events is it's really going to be interesting to watch and, and think about how we have to adapt as employers. Um, and again, I just I end this by employment projections as well, and this is all just national data um, that I'm sure uh, many of you read on a daily basis. Um, but with that, I would love if we have a few moments um, to go into an employee share, I would love to hear from all of you. Like I said, I am uh, new for the second time to this area, um, but I would really like to understand and hear from you all about uh, anything I presented today that you say thumbs up, this is exactly what's happening, or something that's missing that you're noticing here in Douglas County, um, I would really love to hear from you all. So um, with that, I would A, love to hear from you all, um, but also open it up to your questions and I'll stop sharing, we'll go from there. Great, thank you, Mike. That was fantastic. I appreciate you gearing it toward the, the time frame that we have here. So I know that that was challenging to crunch it. And I'll just say that, I do think Mike and I talked about, should this be a two-parter or something? Because the appendix is fantastic. The information that you can dive into there is fantastic. And that's kind of next level, I think, for employers. I think it's information we need to know. Uh, it's fascinating. And so uh, whether or not we use another government community affairs slot to do that, because I know we've got some presentations kind of lined up. Um, I think what we'll do is schedule this maybe as a, a, an off time from GCA, but to, to do a second one and dive into the appendix a little deeper would be great if you're willing to do that. Um, I see uh, Lori McSorley. Actually, Lori, if you want to unmute yourself um, and just share your, your, your comments or questions there, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, so recently I read an article about um, a full-time four-day work week, giving employees a three-day weekend and improving that life-work balance. And that was something that was really creative and out of the box and something I'd never heard of before. And so I was just curious what your thought is on this and, and maybe some other ideas that you have on out-of-the-box ideas to incentivize employees to come work for you versus another company. Yeah, I mean, the, the four-day work week, um, you know, back when I worked at Discover Financial in Chicagoland in 2000, they had piloted it then. Uh, so I think some companies have been doing it for decades. I think that um, a lot of the stuff you've heard today is stuff that companies have been doing for a long time. It's just now uh, people are comparing notes and they're expecting it more. So uh, I think it's wonderful and um, I'm all for it. I, I And I think you saw in the slides I presented that uh, employees are demanding that. And if I can get my same amount of widgets done, so to speak, in four days versus five, why wouldn't you let me do that? Um, now, I know many of us have brick and mortars and it's a different thing. We have a whole bunch of people that work in our cafeteria. We have a whole bunch of people that work on site for our facilities or security. They can't work from home. They can't do a four day. So I think that's the bigger challenge. How do you, how do you accommodate this workforce uh, demand and flexibility for those that you can't? Uh, condense that time work? That's the bigger question, the bigger challenge, I think. And, and how you get creative around that. Um, open invitation. I'd love any of you that have these specific employee issues to partner with you all, because I, I love a good challenge. And if I can help, it helps me get to know your business. And I, I'd love to brainstorm. Thanks for the question or comment. I don't see anything else in the chat at the moment. Um, do enter in the chat if you'd like to speak or ask a question. Um, while we wait on that, Mike, one thing that popped up, um, the participation rate. So we've been watching that a lot. And um, I subscribe to Bureau of Labor Statistics emails and really geek out on that, that information at times. Um, the Kansas, the participation rate, labor participation rate in Kansas, and that for everybody is, is it's not your unemployment rate. It's tracking how many people who are able to work are actually pursuing work. That, because once they stop pursuing work, they're not counted in that unemployment rate. So when we have a 3% unemployment rate, you know, if we're underperforming in our labor participation rate, then that means we've still got workforce here that's untapped. Kansas was lagging by almost 10% for everything I saw. But did I hear you correctly say that Kansas is uh, you know, post-pandemic is currently outpacing national average? 
Yeah, the, the, the data that I uh, used, and it's crazy because um, I thought I just got this awesome new report and it's already two months old, so it already needs to be updated, but that was as of December, so I believe if my slide said it was, um, it was off the same source you were uh, mentioning, 67% um, in Kansas, and it was 59% nationally, so that, that uh, to me says that Kansas is higher that the people that want to work uh, are working at a higher rate than nationally. Okay, good stuff. Uh, Steve Kelly has a thought or question. Yeah, thanks. Mike, excellent presentation, lots of great information. I had a question or comment, and, and you touched on it already, and that's the mental health, behavioral health aspect of the workplace and, and actually just kind of the life balance. You know, one of the things that I have seen uh, or have observed in some in doing some review is that while many uh, employers uh, health plans have mental health coverage that when people actually try to access it is very difficult because there are so many providers that aren't part of a network and so you you know and, and I don't know what the reason is whether it's it's reimbursement rates or what but it it creates a real challenge for people who are trying to seek mental health and using their employer health plan because of the inability to qualify as part of a network. So the deductibles are extremely high and you have a very high upfront cost before the possibility of reimbursement comes in. So I think, I think more employers are recognizing the importance, but I think there's gonna to need to be a better sync up with the insurance industry and also with the healthcare, mental health providers to get that into balance because it's it's not working as well as I think it should. Yeah, Steve, um, you're hitting on something that I'm personally and professionally really passionate about, um, you know, mental health and getting people access to that, uh, particularly in rural environments like Kansas. Um, and again, I'm not trying to do an advertorial, but that's why we launched that My Resource uh, tool this year, because what was happening was this. People go to their primary physician uh, with a behavioral health issue. The primary physician has to refer them to a specialist oftentimes. So you're getting a lot of people going to primary care for stuff that it's an extra, it's extra cost to the system, right? Um, but if we can get people paired up with a mental health professional specific to their behavioral health need, whether it's sleeping disorder, anxiety, relational issues, um, we will minimize costs, but also increase uh, the amount of people that can get care. And we just did it as a pilot. And we found that we were getting people from Western Kansas that were making appointments telephonically with providers right here in Douglas County, because there's such a need. People don't know where to go. Um, and you go online and it shows to your point, Steve, are they in network or not? And then it, and, and let's just be, be frank. Um, most provider finders are pretty basic. They don't really tell you a lot about anything. And a lot of them say um, providers are not accepting new patients, which is often not true because the data is lagging. Um, another recent example, I, I went to find a provider here in Lawrence uh, as a new person. I need to get my annual physical. I go online and um, I, I will say that my, my doctor is Dr. Nathan Bloom. He's uh, in the Western Lawrence. But I will tell you the reason I selected him, there wasn't much to select off of. It was, uh, where does he physically office? Um, and basically they showed me the list of providers in alphanumeric order. So there's a reason why I probably have Dr. Bloom because he's in the B section. <laughs> and when I went to look for reviews, there wasn't many reviews on him at all. I just could find out where he went to school and where he was located. That's not a whole lot of information to make a decision about my health. Um, but if that's happening in the physical, like, um, healthcare space, it's even worse in mental health. So there's a huge gap there. And, and mental health is even more personal in many respects, uh, when you're dealing with specific behavioral health. So it's a huge issue and it's something I'm really proud that I was able to help bring it here. I would encourage you all to check it out. It's a really cool experience. Um, go, go to our website, bluecrossblueshield.com, bcbsks.com. You'll find it, it's on the homepage. It's a, it's a neat experience. Thank you for the question and comment, Steve. 
Anyone else? Um, I'd love to hear about what your business is dealing with as it relates to modern workforce challenges. Any Anything that I missed or anything that you would add? I'd, I'd love to hear it. Well, Mike, I, I'll just touch base real quick while folks think, well, hold on, here's Casey. Casey to May. Casey, you just want to unmute yourself and ask Mike? Sure. Um, my question is, as we talk about giving uh, employees flexibility with their work hours, how do you balance that with creating kind of that unhealthy expectation that people are, are then available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to respond? Thank you, Casey. That, that's part of the transparency piece that I talked about. Uh, for example, I, I have an employee and she has to drop off all, she has three kids and I mean, I have three kids too. And it is a small chore to drop them around Lawrence. I mean, it's an hour and a half block of time that I'm gone. I mean, and <laughs> I have to complain to the school board or something that it's like one school ends at three, one's at 3.30, one's at four. So. Uh, so even myself, I, I'm just not available. And I mean, I work for a CEO of the company and he's, he knows that on Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm just not going to be available for a two hour chunk of time, right in the heart of when all these companies are expected to be here, kind of butts and seats, so to speak. And, and I, and I pay that forward to my own employees. So I think it's that transparency is like, look, you are not clocking in, so to speak from eight to five. Uh, and plus with Teams and Zoom and all these other things, we are so hyper-connected. It's almost, a, a, I think where you're going, Casey, is this overworking thing where people just don't know when to hang it up. <laughs> uh, but I think it's that flexibility. It's, and it goes back to the outcomes-based organizations. As long as you get your work done and you have that agreement with your leadership, you're okay. But I will tell you, a lot of employers, they're not comfortable with that because they, they didn't work that way. They weren't trained that way. Um, that's not the way they made it to where they've made it. They had to put in their time and, and show up, um, but all that's changing. And, and I think you all know that. So anyway, thank you for that, that uh, thought question. Thank you. And thank you for your time today. Yeah, Mike, I should, we, we normally start by introducing everybody to our speaker first, but on Zoom, it's, it's more difficult. Casey's our assistant city manager in charge of budgets and whatnot. Uh, Steve Kelly, of course, is our vice president of economic development here. Um, and I apologize, uh, Lori, with Visiting Nurses Association. Uh, Tyler Lundquist is with uh, uh, an engineering firm here in town, Gould Evans, and uh, had a good comment in the chat box. Tyler, you want to just share that with the group? Sure. Um, we're actually an architecture planning and design uh, studio here in Lawrence, but have studios across the country. But in our office in Lawrence, um, while we're offering a hybrid work environment and flexible work schedule. We are asking that staff come in on Thursdays if all possible. We have studio meetings, pinups, um, lunch together and various activities. That way we're still having that in-person collaboration which is really important for like uh, that industry to be able to look at each other's work and share it and get feedback in person rather than just online. And so far it's working really well for us. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Hey, Mike, this is Patrick Schmitz. Good to see you again from Burton Ash. I, I, yeah, it's great to see you, Patrick. To, yeah, we, we, uh, we've had a great chance to get to know each other. Um, question for you in, in, in that research, I'm really looking forward to it. And thanks again for the presentation. You know, being in a healthcare business, and especially one where the need for what we do has just exploded, it's for us, it's that challenge of how do we create an environment that allows that flexibility for our employees, but is also responsive to the just expansive need for what we do um, and attempts to allow flexibility and all of that. It's really a challenge. I'd be interested if, if, if you're seeing some really good innovative things across other healthcare settings. So just to kind of reframe what I think you're asking me, Patrick, is uh, what are the creative ways where employers are kind of enabling people to connect with behavioral health? Is that kind of what you're asking? Not just connecting with behavioral health, but for our behavioral health workforce, 
how do we, I mean, because for us, the flexibility is telehealth and, you know, a lot of different things that we quickly pivoted to, but it's, it's really, um, how do, have you seen anything in terms of healthcare employers with really good uh, retention rates and flexibility and satisfaction of, the, of their staff while they're dealing with an increasing need for their services, as well as their own anxiety, right? I mean, as a, as a nation, as a world, our anxiety has ramped up because of the pandemic. And so they've got their own anxiety, they're dealing with the anxiety of their clients, maybe even the, the acuity of their clients is higher. And we're saying, and we need you here at these hours to provide this care. It's like, how do you balance all of those needs? Yeah, I, you know, I, I that would be a good question for you, Patrick, because I know that's what you're dealing with. I don't work in the, the clinical space, but I could just give you an example. My sister, who's a nurse in Chicagoland, and uh, how she's had such a hard time dealing with just very difficult people, um, you know, giving hundreds of COVID shots a day and how unappreciative people are and how it has affected her physically and mentally and her stress levels uh, blood pressure, all that other stuff. I don't want to share any PHI, but bottom line is um, it's a real struggle. And her employer, um, Good Shepherd Hospital, uh, they have put physical rooms in their hospital that are like, and they used to do this in ad agencies. They were like themed, like spa rooms, like they're dark with like spa music going on, like relaxation rooms, like just like completely spa music, kind of like creating these. Like, so how do you take these brick and mortar areas and reinvent those spaces to signal whether people use them or not, um, you know, that, hey, you you care about this and creating those little environments. So that's the only example I can think of um, that I've heard of personally um, that some employers are doing to try and create those innovative spaces for people to kind of relax. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that was just one example that came to mind. It does, and, I, and I'll look at that other, your slide about some of the non-traditional ways of showing staff. I mean, like box sending them box snacks, uh, uh, boxes of snacks, and there's other kind of weird, not weird, but different things you just don't right. think about. Yeah, easy. another another one, and someone just gave me, and I just wrote it down, I can't find it, but it's, uh, it's an app that, uh, I think it's called Calm, and then there also Headspace, you've probably heard of that but employers are also paying for subscriptions for services like that. That's another thing that I also read. I just put it in this report, but some of those um, low cost, high perceived value type things. So it's not gonna break the bank, but you know, for a couple hundred bucks, um, the financial piece, um, um, we are piloting a program. It's about 20 bucks an employee. So it's not a lot, but it is a complete um, year long financial well being training. And um, that has got an incredibly high perceived value. Actually, the retail value of it is about 150 bucks. So it isn't cheap, um, but we got it for a discounted rate of 20 bucks. And that is something that we're getting a lot of interest in because people want to know how can they save money for retirement because people want to retire early. Again, that's another thing that I didn't put in here. It's just time is limited, but there's also this trend of people retiring earlier. And they're just like, you know what, I'm out. Um, all this flexibility stuff, what my employer wants me to do, I can't work how I wanted to work. I'm just going to hang things up. That's a whole nother presentation, the, the great resignation or the great retirement um, that I could talk about as well. So I think the more flexible we can be with these low cost, high perceived perks that are relevant, like financial or mental health or relaxation are going to be, are going to be the way to, where to invest. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I think this, uh, this is the type of information that is, um, um, has a high level of interest, Mike. So I appreciate your offer uh, to do this for us. And uh, I do see us potentially, we'll talk about maybe doing something again in the near future. Um, thanks so much for making it, it fit within this time frame. It's great info. Everybody, I, I want to remind you that we're going to go back to in-person starting in March. So that's going to be, I believe it's March 9th. Um, that we will be at the uh, KU Innovation Park, formerly, formerly known as the Bioscience Technology Business Center. And uh, we'll unveil uh, the guests here soon to that. So keep your eyes out. But uh, again, thanks so much, Mike Garish. I'll look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Have a great thanks day. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you. Have a great day. Take care.